Molt bona tarda, benvingudes i benvingudes.
So basically, as I was telling you, the idea is that in this master's degree on technology, we teach technologists and profess professional vocational education educators, which with the quality qualifications they should have. And the topics we will talk about here today are known by everybody. But in the same way, when you want to learn English, you go to an English teacher, or when you want to learn Spanish or Catalan, you go to an Catalonian or Castilian Spanish teacher. Well, uh, he, in this case, it's other colleagues that we have to talk to when we have questions about media literacy and digital ethics. What does media literacy mean? We could be talking about this for hours on end, but that's not the point. The point is that a person who is literate, who has who is media literate should have a digital citizen. He or she should be able to do anything that people in our society need to do, to work with a PC on the internet, to find a job in the internet, to communicate with other people through the net, you know, Kindle and message networks. Sex, at the end of the day, is a crucial way of communicating, as Woody Allen would say. We buy through the internet, we have internet banking, we have safe cards, basic medical things to have a, an appointment with my doctor. And for example, to do your income tax declaration and then to enjoy safe leisure, games, etc. This should be all of the knowledge the basic knowledge that any student should have when leaving compulsory school. We should wonder whether we attain this or not. Then other issues. Do not eat up everything cookies to predicate with example because this in time restrictions control crimes to comply with the law. And then I'll mention briefly disinformation because narrator will talk about this later. So with regards to the cookies, this is something we find when we go to any web page like this one, I reckon that you have all signed up here. And here's the, we have the first difficulty with cookies. And this is nothing against the organizers, but notice that it's in English. Most attendants will have no problem with that. But my parents-in-law, when they see this, they do not know what to do and then they accept it all. Because if not, they can't navigate. Therefore, we have to think if whether we are somebody like Homer, we're just passive navigators and we won't read it all because that's comfortable. From that point of view, do not, not accepting cookies turns us into proactive citizens against large corporations. In a conference that I curated at the Makaya Palace recently, Carrie Isabel and Renata Albia, activists on privacy, said that to not to refuse accepting cookies is what gives us the greatest power to become empowered as digital citizens. There are Web pages that make it more difficult, like this one for a sports journal. At some point, if you want to see how the Euro Cup is going, you have to click individually. You have to refuse, 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 and you have to stay there for some time. That's because you're very active. And sometimes even it to all of our partners, if it was to all of our partners, fine, you just keep it and that's it. But sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes there are exceptions amongst these partners. And if it, it, it says block all of the parties, but sometimes they make it very difficult so that you eat up a cookie you do not want to eat. So first of all, let's be proactive citizens and let's refuse cookies. One way to train students with regards to personalized ad cookies, etc., which I believe, well, well, there are some textbooks, you know, high school technology books, is science fiction with activities that could be to present small film fragments in three steps. First, you have to see whether the student interpret well whether there is, you know, a trailer to make some research about the technology. And finally, what do you think about personalized or tailor-made ads? And this is a discussion topic in the classroom. The second very important point is whether we are acting as role models and are we consistent when we use a mobile? There are high schools in which the teacher himself forbids the use of mobiles. And whilst he's testing people, he uses a mobile. So as teachers, what sort of a role model are we? 
And this is a crucial issue if we actually set the example. And here with the OMA, the main project a few years ago, training people who are devoted to addictions, I actually recommend the Jova project. It is uh, a special pro program for young people who are especially addicted. A basic two pattern, a, a, a manly or masculine pattern. I mean, to give the mobile to the baby. Here, I give the mobile to my child, and in the meantime, I can have a bear with my colleagues when that was allowed to. This is typically masculine pattern that generates isolation. And that's why here children feel that the smartphone is something individual. Okay, I use a smartphone to get rid of my child. And thirdly, well, women do this too. That doesn't mean that men do not do this too. To generate a personalized image based on the photographic or videos we generate and that we post on the network. And something else is here, okay, to make a picture, oh, you look really bad here, let's make another one. Think of the message we're sending to the child, especially the girls who are under great pressure and we have lots of cases of anorexia and bulimia because of rejecting of the idea that sometimes your image is ugly, you do not look good. Does this have consequences? Of course, many, very briefly. Technologies are the entry gate to many addictions. We have online gaming, then we have Enrique Cheburia, who has actually researched about this, like abusing the internet, purchasing addiction or compulsive buying, and sex addiction, pornography related to this. So what can we do? I recommend a book by the previous moderator, Liliana Arroyo, You Are Not Your Selfie, and other summer readings that are like irresistible, when we can think about first to work on the self-esteem of our students and then to see what corporate and interests and business interests that are, are lying behind these new technologies. Secondly, let's talk about the age time restrictions. Pediatric associations, the Canadian, Canadian and uh, American ones say that up to the year, up to two years, no screens from two to five, maximum one hour a day, and as an example, here you have this video. This is an application generated with a TV, with, with something that generated a lot of controversy in 2018. You know, instead of talking about, you know, the plane does it, I mean, they do it digitally with a mobile. That implies exposing children to a mobile phone from a very early age and to be disconnected. I love going to a spa, and sometimes if you make a picture, but when you see kids who have the waterproof phone in the swimming pool, even in that spa, it's horrible. And I'm talking about leisure. I'm not talking about the digital exposure. And as a as activity, I recommend you as teachers and to everybody, and also students, there are some applications like quality time that allow you for one week to install in the smartphone and see how many hours you devote a day to each application. In other words, what are you devoting your time with a mobile? It is something that's quite educational for ourselves, quality time or moment. And finally, disinformation is a topic that the radar will talk about. It's something that's crucial for teenagers, but also in high in, in, in grammar school, which is to inform young people about what are the, the criminal behaviors that we could be carrying out without knowing? We have to know what is a crime in the internet and what is not. Sometimes they make fun. For example, when somebody leaves a, an open session, they play to substituting uh, somebody else's personality. They do it as a, as, a, as a joke, but it is a crime. So when uh, somebody is asking you your bank data, to try and substitute you or to actually get your money. Okay, that's a crime. You cannot substitute anybody else's personality in the internet. Then grooming, when adults uh, act as if they were minors to actually try and get closer them to obtain sexual content images, which could bring you to other more delicate situations. And we have bullying and cyberbullying 
the violation of your privacy, stealing your images, threatening you, insulting you, or saying, okay, you're stupid and you do not know how to do your homework. Well, that is an insult and it is a crime. Or, you know, bombarding you with messages or phone calls. And then happy slapping. I mean, sometimes they do it as a joke when, when you hit somebody and then you, you post it and they disseminate it. Well, all of these are behaviors that are criminal and they have to know about it. These are crime. The police in Catalonia, they actually make presentations about this. And specifically, one I'd like to devote a few minutes to, which is sexting, which is testing people about sexual content. What happens here? It is terrible, but what they do it amongst minors to send sexual, sexual, sexual content, I mean, it's also children's porn. It is a crime. I mean, if I send sexual content to my partner and she gives it back to me and that's it, fine. But given that this is not what happens normally, but you know, when, 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 when they, when, when they hide that private content gets out and it's disseminated, that's a crime. The Spanish Agency of Data Protection, I recommend you visit the website. They say, do not exchange private photographs or intimate photographs with people you do not know. Careful with private. Do not joke with sexual content because for example, to make a joke, sometimes, it could be uh, something that reduces the the, con, uh, the sentence for a sexual aggressor. You know, this was a joke, he could say. And do not publish your private photographs in the social media or do not resend the content. Uh, for example, look at her teeth, do it. Well, they resend it and they are committing a crime. It was a document done by the AEPD, the Spanish agency, for data protection that I recommend. Now, the usage age. Why do I say this? I recommend you to follow P. Duchemont at Twitter. He carries out a very educational tweets. One specifically, it is, he has a book. He has published a book called, I'll wait for you at the exit about bullying. Very interesting for parents. But he talked about TikTok especially. He says he has won uh, trials and he has a line of a helpline for families that have a very low income. And in one specifically, he always writes, maybe he's listening to me, uh, maybe this is being recorded, but there was one that he won a trial and he found another expert who was defending a sexual harasser, a pederast online. The point was that a girl told her parents that there was a man that she thought was an older man who was asking her sexual content photographs for TikTok. What happened? Well, I'm going to, well, this is a spoiler, but it's interesting to follow this up. What happened is that during the trial, the only thing he said is that she was posting videos in TikTok and the defense said that if she's posting videos in TikTok, the Pedra said, well, I thought she was of age because after 18, you, you, you can only publish content in TikTok if you are 18. What do I mean by that? Well, when parents and teachers somehow are not complying with the limitations because there was a pederast around who just got around it because he said, well, she was just posting things uh, of when she was 14 or 15. But he said, oh, I, I thought she was you know, of age. She was 18 because that's what the rule says at TikTok. It's very serious. And another very important point, and Nereida, please correct me if I'm wrong. This information is another crucial topic. Which information do we give in the internet? What happens with the internet of things? As emitters of information, is the information we're receiving true? There is disinformation, fake news, and even more so, deep fakes. 
or anything related to AI to generate videos that look real, but they are false. Here are some very interesting readings for you. Fake you, fake news and disinformation and privacy spa and all the books that I recommend you to read. So without any further ado, I'm going to give the floor now to the reader. I guess that I will be off right now. Tony, thank you so much. How interesting all of the things you have mentioned. In fact, I can tell you that I loved this application. You have talked about quality time. And I think I'm going to use it with my technology student, my, my technology student. Well, as a professor, I recommend it for you too. Sometimes you think, well, we are always, are always connected, but what do you do? Maybe you're connected differently. You will be surprised. You're probably connected all the time yourself. And I'd like to say that the reference you have made to Professor Duchemont, but in fact, this year I have found some students, fifth grade students, with whom I had to do some dancing robots, and some students told me that they wanted to post these dancing robot videos in TikTok, and it was thanks to the computer expert at the school who told me, careful, careful with TikTok. And then he sent me the link of Professor Duchemont. And when I read all of that, I finally decided that the videos could not be posted on TikTok in order not to give greater fuel to a network that to me is not all that clear. Well, we could talk about this at length, but I think they are all insecure, TikTok too. They are unsafe, but in Italy they have banned it for minors. And maybe in other countries they will follow suit. But at any rate, I think it's important to say, in fact, Duchemont says that it should be, TikTok should be fully banned. And he's carrying out a campaign against TikTok. But anyway, maybe this is food for thought without these, you know, could we think about, could we say the same about these other networks, Instagram, for example, fine, Cody. Fine, so next, let's give the floor to Nereida Carrillo. Good afternoon, Nereida, good afternoon. Nereida is a journalist, she's a PhD in journalism and communication, she's a researcher and a professor at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. She's the founder of Learn to Check, an educational project to compensate this information and to explain the digital verification to young people, professors, families, journalists, people, librarians, and other audiences through her digital literacy workshops. Fine, thank you, Vicente. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers to, for having invited me to this forum. And Tony's presentation was so interesting. I've learned a lot about from his dissertation and all of the resources he has recommended to us. Okay. I'm going to show you my presentation. I'm going to be talking about this last point that Tony mentioned, disinformation, because I believe that this is a crucial topic and I think we need to have lots of collaboration and coordination to solve a problem that we all face and that we will be discussing in this session. At Learn to Check, we have a project, a project that I'm promoting. We work for digital literacy and media literacy of all citizens, especially young people and educators. What we want is to get critical thinking closer and verification tools and processes, digital verification, tools and processes for everybody, because we believe that to learn to verify information, the information that gets to us through the social media and message applications is the most efficient and empowering solutions to navigate in a disinformation and informative chaos environment. Let's go step by step, piecemeal. What do we, what do we mean by disinformation? Well, the first draft explained it in a quite revealing way in this half. First draft is a reference organization when it comes to talking about disinformation. 
in many journalistic discussions about this information, and he will explain in a quite revealing way what this information is all about. This information is an informational disorder. It is a situation of chaos, of confusion, a problem we need to face when we want to be informed. In the internet, there is false information. There is also information that tries to damage a person, a group, or a community. And in the intersection between these two groups, we have disinformation. How do we understand it? Disinformation could be defined as false information that's distributed in a deliberate way, in a in an ill-intentioned way in order to fool people, in order to hurt somebody, an individual or a group. And normally, as a girl, it wants to get some political gain, economic or personal gain. It also contributes to the noise. I mean, erroneous information, false information, that the person that distributes it believes that it is true or malicious information. And, and, and this sense has already talked about, well, Tony has talked about this in his presentation. Information which, whether true or false, has a common denominator that it tries to hurt somebody. I believe that's cool, and educators are the ideal place to approach this problem. And digital literacy and ethical literacy are the tools to be used, because the school, through education, combats false information with knowledge with the two components of disinformation. We struggle against erroneous or false information through knowledge, and also uh, hate messages with an education based on values and respect for what's for difference, what's different. So we need digital and ethical literacy to manage a problem that's not new. Disinformation has always existed, and experts forecast that it will keep on existing. But nowadays, Technology and the social media are becoming increasingly sophisticated and they amplify lies that reach instantaneously many, many people. Goebbels, the propaganda minister of the Nazi government, Adolf Hitler, mostly said a sentence that if a lie is repeated thousands of, of, of times, it becomes a truth. Well, the social media make this possible in a few seconds. That's why we need this critical thinking that allows us to distinguish between what's true and what's false, but that which we can verify and that which is false, and that tries to manipulate us. And precisely this critical thinking is an ability, is a basic skill that has been identified as a basic skill according to the McKinsey Global Institute. It is a basic tool for the future, together with others, communication, digital. Daniel Inerarity actually did this. We need this critical thinking to be future workers, but also to be citizens today, to be digital citizens. Therefore, we need to inform ourselves adequately in the internet. And this is key for democracy. And it is crucial for health as well. We have seen it through the pandemic. And we need to know how to filter information in a saturated environment. We need to learn how to verify and distinguish between this false and true information in a society, in, in this disinformation society that Daniel in a rarity talked about. And we also need to demand and practice digital ethics. And this implies asking or demanding transparency and equitability to algorithm creators. And this is something that Karma Peru will talk about. Algorithms that nowadays are like a black box to us. We know very little about them. And if they deny the knowledge about how algorithms work to us, they are denying us a crucial element for communication, which is the context, to know why things happen. And without access to algorithms, in other words, without knowing why things happen, we can't reproduce, change, or amend what happens. Therefore, media uh, di media literacy implies having skills like accessing, analyzing, evaluating, creating, and acting with the different communication forms. 
it is not just about consumption the internet but we need to promote that our young people are creators so that they can be imaginative creators in this environment we need to have these skills because you know from reading the print press all the way to TikTok, from humor or video game to the hate speeches and populism that our young people are constantly in touch with through the social media and today accessing it in my in place not only having i mean ha having connection this is what this week the, uh, the, the mobile world congress the expert lawyer on digital rights renata avila reminded us of the digital gap nowadays is not about connectivity but ac data access and social innovation and from that point of view access is, is, is it from this point of view that access i mean they, they, they deny the, the other capacities and skills to analyze, evaluate, create, and act. Renata Avila said that girls nowadays, or girls nowadays to create platforms tomorrow, we need, they need to have access to data, not only to consumption of the internet. We have to make it possible to analyze and evaluate information are also key skills. And here we need to net an alliance between journalists and educators. We need to filter and verify information that is always been capabilities and responsibilities that are basic for journalism. Now that they have also become citizen skills, journalists can actually convey our knowledge to society and take advantage of this opportunity to cooperate and recover the credibility now that we have such a bad situation. The credibility of journalists is at a very low level nowadays due to the impact of the different economic crisis in 2008, which have had a key impact in the quality of journalistic content. Therefore, professors need to learn and teach digital verification in their classroom as an essential way of creating young people with critical thinking. But they should also learn a lot from their students because it is other students who have this fundamental skill in digital environment, which is to create. They are the ones who create memes or TikTok videos or Instagram stories like nobody else can do it. So we teachers have to make an effort to coach them in these activities to be able to create together some content. They are the ones who on learn in very little time how a network works and they learn a new one. It is, you know, the, w w the, w without reticence, they are always ready to face constant change. We need to learn and create together. And in order to survive in a complex world, like the one we live in, um, you know, the society in the 21st century will be collaborative and multi-generational. And to survive it, we need all of the skills and we need everybody. And here are the resources we have, an open source website that we have in English, Spanish, and Catalonian. And I explain, I'll explain what you can find in Learn to Check. In the Verifica lid, you can find articles with the processes and tools to verify information, photographs, videos, and of course, social media. Under the games lid, you can access resources for the learning by doing methodology with games about the trivial of disinformation or games to try and localize photographs or a compilation of games in Spanish and English, which are all related to information. And I repeat, it is in Spanish and in English. It is all related to information and disinformation with media teaching. And then in the videos lead, you have some short videos with experts who think about disinformation and the legal consequences of disinformation, the crimes that Tony mentioned that we need to know about, and we need not to promote them. And also we have some tutorials with young people who verify some specific things like photographs or videos. And thus we tell them what's the process about how to do it. And then we also have didactic guidelines 
and proposals for the classroom. And under the more resources lid, we have manuals that are useful to analyze the matter in greater depth. And we, I also recommend our newsletter and our Twitter accounts and Instagram accounts where we actually post new content about digital literacy. I hope these resources will be useful to all of you. And I hope that in this job, I mean, teachers who want to bring this to the classroom, this will be just a first step for media literacy. In other words, we need to know how to understand other messages or communication forms. Why do these messages circulate? Who, what are the sources? What issues are being focused on? What things are turned invisible? What are the data that are given? What are the data that are not given? And this is crucial. A few days ago, we talked to Michelle Lipkin, who is the chairwoman of the National Association for Media Literacy in the USA. And we, she said that it is so important that media literacy is not just about information. It should go beyond. It should not just be about disinformation. It should not be fall into the binary trap. This is true and this is not true. Because sometimes information is neither true nor false. It is complex. And as, as the world is complex, it is not a binary world. We have a very complex world. So we need to educate in order to accept managing and acting within complexity. Because I believe this is the key to the future. It's going to be revolutionary. Thank you very much for listening to me. This is the end of my presentation and now I give back the floor to you, Vicent. Well, thank you, Narita. Well, basically, I take home a very interesting message, the need to teach our students to filter, verify, and contrast information, and to actually have critical thinking. As a teacher, I was thinking, well, let's see, how could we go about this? How could I apply this to my classroom? And you yourself have told me how to do it showing us this wonderful web page of learn to check with so many resources, incredible resources that I'm going to visit and I'm going to really make the most of it because I think it's very interesting. Thank you, narrator. Thank you. During the discussion, I'll give you more ideas about workshops I've carried out with young people to tell you what it worked out and what doesn't work out. Thank you. Excellent, narrator. Thank you. And finally, we have here Karma Piro. Good afternoon, Karma. Good afternoon, Vicente. Karma is a journalist specializing in information technologies, information communication technologies, ICT. And she's the co-director of the Foundation for the Visualization of Transparency that promotes open data to empower citizens. She's also the co-director of a master's degree on visual tools to empower citizens and a member of the Advisory Council of the Ethics Observatory on AI in Catalonia and of the Ethics Committee at the Polytechnic University of Catalonia. You have the floor. Thank you, Vicente, for this presentation. I'm going to share my screen next. Please tell me if you can see well my full screen. You can? Okay, lovely, thank you. Okay, I'm so happy to be here with all of you, with Vicente and Tony and Areda. Tony has really introduced the topic in a well-tuned way with what I'm going to tell you. We agree on many, many things you have said. Thank you. I'd like to thank the IMAT schools or actually this initiative, the MS Schools Ed Change 2021. When I was invited, I thought, oh God, what am I going to tell them? Well, the, 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 you know, what I'm going to talk about is the importance of, of a very important role played by education. As Tony and Narita have said, my idea is to tell you how AI is already in schools and in educational centers and how it will change the future of teaching this, this emerging technology. To start, 
let me share with you a case. I'm sure you have heard of it. In August last year, like in so many other countries, we're trying to cope with the pandemic. And there were people who were protesting against the government because they applied an algorithm in the correction of exams. And the qualifications office said that they would take a gigantic leap forward, technological leap forward in pandemic times, which is to solve the problem that students had to go to the classroom. And with an automated intelligent system, i.e. an algorithm, what they did is to simulate a pattern which is similar to the result of previous years, so that pandemic students were not affected. But what happened? And why did students demonstrate it? Well, what happened is that the algorithm fixed a predefined model in the student's grades based on statistics. And it ended up reducing by 40% of the cases, the evaluations of professors, because in the calculation, history, the story, the history of each student and the judgment of professors minus the quality of the center and the neighborhood where that center was located. In other words, the student's average grade reduction for poor students, students with low income students. This is a problem that affected the British government. They asked for forgiveness, they apologized and they actually look for another way of assessing students. AI has revolutionized all industries. It is a sector that's not beyond it. Last year, UNESCO actually met with 50 ministers for a document, artificial intelligence challenges and opportunities for sustainable development. This document has as main axis what should be or how education should be transformed in the next few years. This document marked the educational policies that needed to be planned in the future. And amongst other things, it says that learning is a fact that will be lifelong, something that we already know, and that AI will help very much in the field of education. This document says so because we will go from task-based learning to collaboration-based learning. AI is nothing new. It exists, it has existed for more than 50 years. It's part of our life through many applications that surround us. Cody has mentioned them, Nereida too. In the educational field, we already find virtual assistants in the classroom, facial recognition systems in schools. And now I'm going to share some examples with you. Algorithms have different possibilities that ease our lives, but they also have an impact on our lives. And not to use uh, AI would be absurd, but it is important what Nereida and Tony have said about digital literacy and a critical awareness of what's going on. Something that you will be listening, hearing about, are that the most sophisticated algorithms are using automatic learning or machine learning and deep learning, something that is able to recommend, but also to predict. And they make automatic decisions. With some of the next examples, you will see it clearly. Last year, during lockdown, I presented this piece of work. I'm the co-author of this piece of work with the Catalonian Data Privacy Authority. It's called ADA in action, research work in Catalonia. I recommend it. Here you will find not an academic piece of work, but an explanation as simple as possible about the complexity we have with regards to the AI that surrounds us in order to feed the curiosity that we all feel, but also to address to all citizens. We explain what are these automated algorithms used for in uh, the field of education, health, legal work, communication. And the best way to disseminate that is to have more than 50 examples in which we explain how all of this is being implemented. 
it has a very important chapter that focuses on ethics. What does ethics mean? What the type of ethics we want to be respected, to respect our, to be, for our rights to be respected. And now let me start with one of the examples I mentioned in the report. This is an example that we have had for many years. More than 70%, many schools in Catalonia are using this software. There are thousands of students who are using this platform, to, this learning platform based on a cognitive development. And this was created by a group of researchers at the University of Barcelona. It is an algorithm that gives support to the decision undertaken by speech therapists, professors, and mathematicians for this type of speech or, or learning disability. Let me give another example. If you're interested in some of these cases, I can give you more information about them later. This is Alex. It is also a software that has been implemented for more than two years now amongst thousands of students. As Carlos Sierra explained from the AI Research Center in Catalonia, we should not be afraid of introducing AI in the classroom. It can be a very good tool to improve the learning process, and it uses adaptational questions to determine a quick way. And those who have used it say it's excellent what a student knows or does not know about a subject matter. And it recommends the student to prepare on some issues or what are the subject matters he or she should prepare better on. And it does a personalized assessment of how he should approach it. It is a system that develops a model for each student and it, there is always support in the classroom. I mean, it is not substituting teachers, not at all. Other applications, these are a few of them, but we have virtual assistants. What is this all about? This virtual assistant, which is a personalized, tailor-made method for each student. And the algorithm, what it does, is to suggest the best classmates to carry out a piece of work. Okay, if you want, I mean, you should go with this or that student, because depending on your skills and capabilities, we will you will reach the goal of that homework. And according to a software expert, it says, well, the classroom will be transformed in a few years' time. The professor will also have a virtual assistant who will actually help him or her in those tasks, personalizing or tailor-making certain tasks for students. Let me show you other things. When four or five students are grouped together to carry out a task, okay, the first thing it does is to evaluate the skills that the students have, that's introverted, extroverted, intuitive, analytical, etc. Based on this criteria, the virtual assistant knows how each student is, and he, it also analyzes the task, and it ends up distributing them in groups. What does a teacher do? As Mrs. Sarah says, well, this software does not make mistakes, and it it's well aligned with the criteria of the professor in most cases. In many classrooms in Catalonia, we have used this technology, and I ask her, okay, the machine could make a mistake and it could group students together that are not in the right manner. And well, we human beings make mistakes. And well, the results on average have produced very few mistakes. There is another example about what an algorithm does. It can correct exams, you know, this horrible, boring task for high school professors and university professors to correct and mark tests. What the professor does is to mark a few tests and then it is all passed on to the machine. And then the machine learns and that's the machine ends up carrying out the marking of the test. And so far it has given excellent results. I mean, I'm just telling you what it does. Then if you have questions, I mean, these are things that are happening already today in Catalonia. 
and then there is facial recognition at the entrance of the school. This implied some controversy because we have a high school, a public high school in Badalud, and most, most families thought it was a good idea. When the student came into the high school, he looked into a machine for his or her facial recognition and the data were collected and that's it. It was like checking that the student had come to school. But if the student was not at school, then there was a message sent, a text message sent to the parents. And then they knew whether the child was not at school or not. But of course, European law forbids this type of practice. And the Catalonian Authority on Data Protection and Privacy withdrew this software. So what type of ethics do we want for with regards to AI at school? It has to be fair. I mean, a group of students carrying out a piece of work, I mean, it could whether that's fair or not, we could discuss this at length. It should be reliable. I mean, it should be truly reliable. And, you know, it should not be what happened to the UK government when they had to withdraw this um, test marking device. It should be safe and it should also protect privacy. This is something that Tony mentioned, but it's super important. And human values should be protected and promoted. And they should be applied in this software. And Nareda has also talked about this with, you know, behind the software, the decision to carry out this marking, this test marking, there is an algorithm. We do not know. We need to know whether behind the mark obtained by our son or daughter to go to a center, there is an algorithm, which are like black boxes, and they are specially protected by European law. And they should be explained. They should tell us how that algorithm made that decision. Why has the algorithm decided to group the students in that way? This is known as a black box. Still, nowadays, because it's very important, it's very difficult to know how the software makes the decision, how the algorithm makes the decision. And we have to promote the common good. But above all, above all, above all, there should be human supervision. There should always be a human being behind the decision to apply or not that outcome. I mean, based on a mark produced by a machine, a human being should validate that result. Let me show you this video for one second. And please tell me, confirm that you're watching it. Vicente, could you confirm, please, that the video can be seen? Yes, we can see, Karma, thank you. No, no. Sorry, Karma, we, you know, there, there are no moving images. We can't see it. Okay, let me go back to the PowerPoint presentation, please. Can you see the PowerPoint presentation now? Yes, now, yes, we can see it, fine. So the video was a 30 second video from the S3 organization, an international organization about for the defense of digital rights. And Xnet, as has been already mentioned, has actually adopted these principles. And what I'd like to mention about this campaign, a campaign that has been led for more than one year now, as you know, all schools, in all schools in Catalonia, 
there is a collaboration agreement signed with this multinational institution. And what it suggests, XXXNet, is to is a plan to control the privacy, the data privacy of miners at calls. Because nowadays, through Google Suite, it is it is not you know people, teachers and families do not know well what the implications are for all of these in the students' lives. And in Google, they see it in all applications, in all schools, and they are not, you know, a critical type of thinking is not promoted. And we need to, we, we do not give them all of the tools to, 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 to study. And we do not tell them the other alternatives, like the ones that are being presented here today, in order to have this data sovereignty. Because Google is in the cloud. And this is out of hand. Okay, I wanted to finish. I, I, I'd like to share with you some conclusions I've drawn. Okay, critical thinking. It's crucial we have critical thinking. In general, all citizens lack awareness about the technological world in which we live. And this is crucial. The development of new tools and is, is actually skyrocketed and it is going so fast. We need to activate mechanisms in order to have a good accountability by the administration, the public administration and the companies. As Vicente has said, the administration should make this available in schools with an open source software. I mean, this technological colonialism is killing us. And at schools, we need to actually know which ethics we want to apply with regards to AI. Maybe we can continue with human beings, teaching and informing. And in case it is useful, like for example, this excellent software like to help us with speech therapy or dyslexia it is very important we always need to know however that there is human supervision behind this software and finally we need to demand training knowledge and explanations of, about this digital culture we need more sessions like this one in order to be to be thinking together to know what in surrounds us so that our curiosity is always fed to make us explore further the technological world in which we live. Thank you. Well, thank you, Karma. Well, basically, thank you for making so evident the fact that AI, at the end of the day, in greater or lower intensity, it's already a reality. We have software, softwares that, that have so many applications to ease our lives as teachers. We have to be aware that there is AI behind it all. And thank you very much for telling us that we should always question when we use a software, no matter how well it is sold to us, we should always question what lies behind them. As you have said, if there is a biased code in the AI or anything that makes that application maybe to be very good, but maybe it is not totally ethical so to speak. And I really liked the fact that sometimes we talk about AI, robotics, but there is always a fear. The fear of saying, oh, this is going to substitute us. Teachers will be useless. Robots will be teachers. And I liked very much the point you've made about the fact that AI needs to be visualized as a help, as a tool, not as a teacher substitute and always, always under human supervision. I love what you said about, you know, this test marking application. 
a lot of teachers who are listening to us are probably very much interested in it. But of course, it would be very interesting to be able to test it out and then to see my own correction of a test and the correction made by the AI application. Thank you, Karma. Well, we have a wealth of links, information, and I'm sure the organizers will share it. And if not, you can find it easily through the internet. Automated decisions in Catalonia, ADI, ADA. Thank you. Okay, now we will start with the Q&A. We have about 30 minutes left for Q&A. And to start, I'd like to tell you, those of you who are listening to us, that if you want to start asking questions, please, you may start using, you may ask us anything you want. There is a little delay, 20 or 30 seconds delay between the question you ask and the time I get it. In fact, if you'll agree, Nereida, Tony, and Karma, maybe you could start out by reacting to each other's presentations. Yes, yeah, so let me break the ice with a, a number of points. Taking advantage of what Karma has said, I mean, we share, we are both at the Polytechnic University, and she knows Luis Cortez and other committee members, and we have had many discussions with them. And one of them, maybe Karma, you'll remember, is that there should always be somebody, a human being behind. For people to understand it well, in, you know, the fact that there is a bar in football, that doesn't depress the referee. And something else that Nereida and Karma have mentioned, behind these software, there are big corporations that are collecting data because education is a big, it's a big business. But to contextualize things, when you have talked about the different applications for fake deep, I, I guess you talk about edu teams with Carlos Sierra behind, right? These applications, and I'm very critical with them because I haven't published it, but personally, the operational Results have bought with fake groups, uh, you know, with uh, according to the list. I haven't found any significant improvement. And when you look deeper into these technologies, sometimes they have a problem. Educational science and learning psychology is behind what these technologies promise. With Myers Briggs, you know, it's a test. I mean, to classify or everybody into 16 personality types. If you'll allow me, it's pseudoscientific. And so I wanted to mention that these grand technologies should be based on educational evidence, some of which are yet to come. And I'd like to encourage all of the teachers who are listening to us that when they receive any technology or any application like this, as Vicente has said, and it shows your critical spirit, Vicente, okay, I'd like to receive it to compare it or to test it out to see how it works, but always with a control group, because if there is, if, the, if not, there is a Pygmalion effect, given that, you know, it, 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 it works, so this is applicable to any methodology, to any application, and without wanting to be overly controversial, but we need to verify that if students if it goes better for students. Learn to check the radar. Is a it, it, it talks about a classical debate because the moment we devote time, because time is scarce in education. We classroom teachers know this. The moment we devote time to any application or any methodology, we have to be sure. We have to be as sure as possible about that met methodology. And therefore we need to test it out. So I would encourage teachers to test it out and to be critical from the very onset. So let's try those applications that the radar mentioned. And if I need, or Karma, if I need four hours and I could reduce it to one hour with another methodology, even if it was an analog methodology, we would have to consider it. Okay, I'm going to shut up now. 
Well, I don't know whether Nereida would like to add anything to what has been said by Tony, but if not, I'm, I'm going to make a comment. Well, with regards to the learn to tech resources, we make available all sorts of resources, but we do not, we never substitute the teacher. These are resources for the teacher and everyone decides what he or she wants, how to use it, etc. We also develop workshops in which we use our own material and other materials, and depending on the group, the age, the subject matter, and the previous knowledge they have about it, it may work or not, and we do something or not. For example, in high school, we run a workshop in which we teach what are the tools and processes to verify things. And then we have a gamified classroom in which we divide students into groups who are digital detectives who have to find out whether a piece of information is true or false. So they have a challenge, they have different tags, and that's how they are motivated. And we deal with some issues and not others, and we gamify it even more. And in high school, we do it in a more on a more discussion based way in a more reflexive way there are many teachers some of which have started using our material and others based on the courses we run carrying out activities or projects or classroom dynamics i mean there are many many ways of doing it for example fake news about whether the Philomena storm uh, is true or not, and then they do snow. Or a professor of history who started gamifying old pictures from the history textbook. And then and we have many resources in Spanish and in Catalan, because a lot of them are in English. And we do it from the point of view of journalists. We are not educators, we're journalists, and we do it from that point of view, how journalism can actually bring forth, how it can actually help educators. Oh, I, I think they're fantastic. Do not misunderstand me, Nereida. I mean, there is a master's course about your resources. Well, we want to compile experiences or people who have carried out or who have other experiences experiences about this information and that it has worked out what it works what doesn't work what examples they give for example we have many examples about hell for example teachers who tell us well if we give them an example from an influencer and to them it is an authority even if that's not accurate or true they can't recognize it because teenagers have that influencer as an authority. So that generates a discussion about technology and about how it's the social media work, freedom of speech and social media. Fakes should be forbidden, yes or no. Why, why not? How it all works. And I believe that, I mean, you talked about the examples, how we act as role models, as teachers and families. A problem we have with technology is the, the element of fascination, feeling fascinated for new things. I use this because it's new, because that will make me look up to date and really trendy. And you are not actually finding out about the convenience of it all. There is this problem of self-image narrator. And I believe this is a problem of our generation. I remember that you all remember a photograph made by Reveladas, which to you, if you were a teenager, you thought you looked really ugly. Oh God, mother, please get rid of that horrible picture in which I look so bad. This is something I keep as a treasure, but you look good in all ways. That's the best way to reinforce self-esteem and a person's image. And now parents with Digital images, let's erase them. 
we have fallen into the trap of telling our daughters and sons that they may look ugly. I mean, we never tell our children, you look good in every possible way to feed their self-esteem. I would say, oh God, you look really bad here. Let's, let's erase this one and let's do a new, another one. And that generates a self-image problem. Here we have a serious conflict. And then behind it, there are subsequent um, addictions or, 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 or eating disorders. Well, and then we have to wonder, we have to question whether this image should be published or not. I mean, these are the, 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 the side effects of it all. Well, if you'll allow me, I'd like to add something. I have on my left-hand side, Nereida, and on my right hand, Tony, and they are talking to each other. Listen, Tony. It's such a privilege to be able to be part of this UPC Polytechnic University's Ethics Committee because it actually forces us to be on our toes. And especially the chapter devoted to ethics on data with Karina Gibert, Ona, and more than, more than 25 different voices that I recommend. But I believe that what Nareda has done is different compared to the AI examples I've given you, in the sense that Nareda, I believe that this project stemmed from the experience we had together in the Catalonian institution. We talked about disinformation, maybe we had it in our heads, but it came a few years later. But what Nareda does is to, is to give material and to save time to educators in order to actually be thought-provoking. With regards to AI, I would reinforce all of the things you have said, Tony, about asking ourselves many questions. I mean, our curiosity as teachers or as schoolmasters to be, oh, wait, wait, wait one second. This software comes to school and it is magic. It normally comes from a private business or it comes from the Ministry of Education. And I wonder many, many times, every public Catalonian school, I mean, the management or the teachers, nobody wonders what will happen with the data belonging to all of our students in the center. What will Google do with our students' data? If you ask that, it, normally they tell you, well, it's all protected, no worries. But there will be many questions. Do not worry, everything will be kept here. Wait, what if Google nowadays is, you know, it, 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 it actually does not comply? I mean, what will happen to our students' data? No, Google will never distribute ad, but Google is a friendly trademark for all Catalonian students. But if, the, if tomorrow Google actually wants to sell a car, it's going to be a Google car. And if they set up a university, it's going to be Google University and everyone will want to go to Google University. Well, I think you're right, Karma. In the realm of public health in the States, Google has the data of hundreds of thousands of people and their medical records, and nothing happens. Well, things do happen. Let's ask ourselves questions. Is it true that nothing will happen? What says the law in Europe? But what option do we offer? Because the point is, I mean, Google is fine. It's just like Homer that I've showed you. Everything is digested. We have open public centers. And we have an activist center like XNet that defends everybody's digital rights. They are giving us an, an option, be it an open source software, a, a, a Google suit as a package where you have the free software program package. What does Google give you that? No. It is impossible for our centers tools to be as good as Google's. Google has a lot of power. 
what I'm what I'm saying is utopian, totally utopian. But other things have been attained. You know, women's voting rights, the LGTBI rights movement, other things have been achieved. Why? Because there was a group of people who protested. The, the moment we have this critical awareness and consciousness, we will do it. Karma, talking about the need to ask ourselves questions, let's ask a few questions from the audience. In fact, Sandra Gonzalez asks, in spite of the fact that the plan, you know, the, the plan XNet is approved, I wonder, is it being applied? Is it already being applied, the XNet plan? No. You will find all of the information in the XNet slash x.net, and if not, go to Google, and you'll find it. Sorry, but you need to use to go to Google or any other and or any other um, machine and find out what the process is all about. Okay, that information is not updated. Given that the Catalonian government will not take up the, the XNet plan, we have presented it to the City Council of Barcelona. I know that in some Barcelona City Council schools, some pilot tests are being applied. So the latest information I have from a month and a half or two months is this. And now that Google is being discussed, this between inverted commas monster, Aurelia Rudon says, do you believe that it would be possible to control Google Workspace or will Google control us? <laughs> well, here there are two things I'd like to mention first. Do you believe it's better to have a monopoly or an oligopoly? Both are bad, but it's better if you can choose it's better to have an oligopoly. Because some thinkers believe that it would be best to have, I don't know, in addition to Google to have Microsoft you know, as a searching tool, as a search machine to have other machine search, other search machines. And then we have these guerrilla warfare. For example, maybe I want to choose something else that does X node. I don't want to be surveilled by the Catalonian government. I mean, teachers' independence and freedom should be above that. So from that point of view, answering the sense question, I believe we cannot fight the big ones, but maybe we can distribute the cake a bit better. There's another book that has been just recently published, Kate Crawford's, and I recommend it specially because clearly AI is neither intelligent nor artificial. Again, she tells us this immediately. There's always somebody behind it and something else that's very clear is that it's not clean, it is not sustainable. You know, saying that things are up in the cloud, it sounds like it's all very sustainable. Well, it's not. And, you know, uh, this is true for any corporation that wants to get into the, the education realm. I mean, in many, many contexts, a good blackboard and talk still works. Thank you. Let's now, Anna Martinez asks a couple of questions first. She thanks us for this very interesting session. And she asks, could it be that AI used to create groups may end up being discriminatory instead of promoting diversity? And linking it up, she says, will students need to learn how to become integrated, integrated into diverse groups in the real world? Will that limit their emotional intelligence, the fact that a machine does it for them? What do you think? Well, this conditional verb tense, it could be, it could be limiting or whatever. It's true. I've introduced here AI without having given you any technical explanation about it. Technicians will kill me. But, you know, one of the challenges that AI has currently in 2021 and for many years to come is the bias, 
the bias that's introduced in the algorithm to train the algorithm. When I say train is to do automated learning, to do machine learning, so that it gives us predictions, so that it makes decisions automatically. This is done by introducing into the machine loads of big data. And what do you do with this data? These are data that most of the time are from the past. They cannot be from the present. We take them from the past and we introduce them into the machine. And in the past, societies were different, studies were different, people were different, communities were different, families were different. There were not so many single parent families. And educational criteria were different. And of course, they get discriminated because the data you are feeding the machine with are data from the past and they are not from the present. Could we perpetuate these biases? As Lafayette would say, yes. Well, if we know our biases, why do we use algorithms? And then I ask him, can we perpetuate mistakes from the past? Yes, definitely, he says. We are fighting in out in the street for our rights and in the new technology, we will be perpetuating the mistakes from the past. That's a situation. And he also highlights the fact that, for example, a teacher may not like a student or may have his or her own pre-judgments because biases are like prejudice. And people who pose the, 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 of not having prejudice are normally the ones who have the greatest prejudices. So you may have a prejudice against a certain group of people and maybe you may have a prejudice against the student. Well, the algorithm will never have prejudice. It will actually just apply the criteria. So we can see the positive side of it. This programming, I mean, the technicians who program it may have ethical knowledge, or they may have non-discrimination in their head or equality of opportunities in their head. And the history of communities and groups in the classroom, and maybe they will program the algorithm with this awareness. Two things. The fact that the teacher chooses, I mean, she should compare her intuition, which is very valid, and her biases, and maybe she should compare it with the decision made by the machine. Normally, it's a psychological, pedagogical tool that is never verified, and that happens with many programs. It happens with artificial vision technologies or the recognition of emotions. Normally, Lehman's thesis, which are constantly being reviewed in emotional recognition tools. And the second part of my question would be, okay, with, you know, to have groups that are not, that have no conflict, we're suppressing the fact that students may actually clash with each other. And we're turning the school into a bubble instead of letting conflict come out under control, of course. But the point is that if the student does not crash against his or her group mates, we are not training them for a working reality where they will find social conflict people who don't think like them, etc., etc. Well, what Antoni has just mentioned, I believe, is crucial. How technology is creating a conflictless environment. That's very comfy. And as social media are designed for this polarity, for disinformation. Their business is addiction. And algorithms show us contents that we like. They may be true or false, but they show us content with which we feel comfortable or ask to keep on going to this social media. And then we ask, does this have an emotional implication at the Mobile World Congress? They said, we should do some research about how this is affecting the human mind. You know, we just consume that which is comfortable to us. And this is suppressing certain abilities on our side. And the emotional part of it is very important. There are psychologists who say that many young men and women you know, there is selfish, which is the best thing that has happened to, to you. They believe that this is the real life of these people. They have no problems, they don't make no mistakes. They always, they always look good in the internet. And this is creating 
a lot of anxiety and depression disorders. And it's important to see how this is affecting a human mind. Carmen has just said that there is discrimination in other fields. For example, algorithms that are used to decide whether a person who is in prison, whether he should have, uh, should be freed on parole or not. And racial, you know, racialized people, black people have less paroles than white people because of historical reasons. And when you go to Google, Google Images, and you say CEO, you will have a bubble, white men, no women. So I think it's also very important to educate and inform people about these biases and to have data to create new algorithms so that all of this doesn't happen. It is true that people have uh, biases, algorithms have biases, and we need to have a combination of both things for machines to correct human biases. But with this human supervision that Karma referred to, we should be able to correct these biases that uh, algorithms have from, you know, the biases of the people who program the, the algorithms and, and the people who are trained by these algorithms. Well, fine. Thank you ever so much. Anna asks, given that she came on board a bit late, and I believe the question is addressed directly to Karma. Have you ever been in a platform or in an AI before Alex? Could you remember it? Remind us of it, please? Well, I reckon she refers to the platform that's useful to overcome this lecture. It is a platform developed by some researchers at the, the University of Barcelona. It's called by Yu Bingbing, Yu Bingbing. And what it does, as I've been told by age researchers, it, it makes that 90% of students improve the reading fluency in about seven to eight months. If you go to any search machine and you look for Yu Bingbing, you will find all of the information you want about it. Thank you, fine. So we are getting to the end of this panel discussion. We have less than three minutes left. I don't know whether Nereida, Karma or Tony would like to end with a final idea or a final comment. Any, anything you believe needs to be mentioned? Well, I've already said that, well, the fact that teachers act as a role model and that they pre they preach with their example with regards to new technologies, they should not do in the classroom what they do not want students to do out in the street. I mean, because normally this is recorded in the internet. And I want to wish you an excellent summer holiday to all teachers. And I would encourage you to read some of the books I've recommended. It's good reading for the summer. It's food for thought. Thank you and have a great summer. If you'll allow me to link up with what Tony has just said, I'd like to say that to educate nowadays in this hybrid world, it also implies to educate digitally. Some of the young people who attend our workshops tell us that sometimes they feel their families do not know enough about this digital world to coach them, but they feel it's so lonely. And it's important, important to be trained to train in digital literacy, in digital citizenship. Because in this hybrid society, we need to teach our children not only to read and write, but also to have these skills, which will be very necessary for them to be 21st century citizens. Well, I would end by saying, by telling all teachers that they should never lose their curiosity to know how this AI works or how these smart systems will work, the ones that will be coming to your classroom. But also, I'd like to quote a sentence by Ramon Lopez de Vargas, who is the greatest AI researcher we have in Catalonia. He recently published an article in which he said something like, I'm going to say it in Spanish, the new suit for AI. And he says that AI is not intelligent. In fact, 
He does not understand the context. In fact, he understands so little of what surrounds us that a very young child can go beyond any AI that we have nowadays in the 21st century, in, 20, in 2021. So I would say that, yes, teachers, when a new application comes to their hands, they should verify it and compare it with your own intuition because your intuition, your human intuition, is normally the best answer. Okay, thank you. I'd like to thank the three of you. And to end now, I'd like to thank all of you for your presence and for the excellent, brilliant papers you have presented, your excellent presentations, the Rada, Tony, and Karma. And I'd like to thank the Mobile World Capital, together with GSMA, for their support for having made possible this discussion panel that expresses the importance of thinking, critical spirit, and ethics as compasses for technological progress in which ourselves and all of our students are fully immersed. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon and have a great summer.